Welcome back to the Uptime Podcast. This is episode 36. I'm your co-host, Dan Blewett, and I'm here with lightning protection expert, Alan Hall. Alan, how are you, sir? Hey, great. A great interview with uh, Paul Guype this week. Really knowledgeable person, been around the industry for a long time, and, and has a lot of great insight into wind turbines and electric vehicles. It was just a really fascinating discussion. Yeah, so our guest today is Paul Guype, and if you're not familiar with Paul, then I guess where have you been? <laughs> I mean, Paul, Paul's been all over the web for a long time uh, covering wind energy. He's been sort of like a wind energy lifer, uh, has worked as, I mean, I'm looking through his bio here, it's hard to know where to start, but uh, policy analyst for numerous organizations over the years. Um, he's been a, a principal in firms uh, evaluating wind turbine technology. He's written eight books on wind turbines. His most recent one, Wind Energy for the Rest of Us, A Comprehensive Guide to Wind Power and How to Use It, is a just a huge reference for everything wind energy. I mean, it's if you want to know about small wind turbines, big wind turbines, ducted, the history of them, all the you know materials, failure, like he's got so many case studies in there. Um, so we, we reached out to Paul because he just seems like one of the, again, like the wind energy lifers who has spent a significant amount of his career, you know, fighting the good fight essentially for wind energy. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those really nice people to come across uh, that you meet in the wind turbine industry that just has a lot of history and, and especially the technical side. He's got a good combination of the technical aspects and the policy aspects, yeah. which we don't get mm -hmm. into too much. But there's a lot of governmental policy and regulations that play in the electric market altogether. And and Paul kind of ties the two together, which was really helpful. Yeah. So back in 2004, uh, Paul was working or started working as uh, the acting executive director for the Ontario sustainable energy association he's talked a bunch about his work over in canada and and some of the just the great things they've done with renewable energy over there um and now like you said we we talk uh, so kind of like the scope of this conversation we talk a, a good bit in the beginning about um electric vehicles because he has a, a current a big passion for the electric car he drives and as a guy who's just overall interested in saving the planet interested in renewable energy interested in green energy and you know he refers to himself as, as a as a greenie uh which paul's paul's a funny guy um but he's been around the whole you know he, we talk about solar we talk about wind and small wind and there's been a lot of challenges and like you said alan there's not only mechanical and engineering and technology challenges but he talks a lot about the fights and uh just the the difficulty in getting policy changes that are going to make wind more viable and and one of the things he speaks to is uh the fact that we should be farther along today than we are yeah we should always be farther along right that's it's always tends to be the case right when you look back you go, wow we should have done better back then but i think that as he points out we're we're catching up very rapidly now and that we're devoting a lot of resources to on the engineering side and the policy side both that we're going to see a lot more wind turbines and a lot more wind turbine activity happen in the next couple of years. Well, one last quick note. Uh, we're going to link to all of Paul's work in the description below. So again, he's a great resource. So definitely check out his website, windworks.org. That's wind-works.org. He's written tons and tons of stuff uh, about a range of topics on the wind industry. Again, he's got eight books. Um, also, just really well written, great references if you're learning to, if you whether you're advanced or new like i'm still relatively new to the uh to the, the wind industry and i've learned a ton um so we'll link to all that stuff in the show notes but yeah without further ado we're gonna jump to our conversation with paul guype all right well paul thank you so much for joining us on the podcast so how are things out there in uh, bakersfield well today it's a, it's a, it's a little uh, foggy which is kind of unusual for sunny Bakersfield but uh, I understand yesterday it was quite windy in Tehachapi which is where all the wind turbines are located so I think they were probably producing pretty good yesterday so do you have uh do you have a wind farm like out your window like how how close are you are you kind of nestled beneath them do you live in a maybe like a hammock are you floating right now Paul <laughs> no, no, I am. I'm a good hour away from uh, the Tehachapi Pass, where the wind turbines are located. There are lots of solar panels uh, here in Bakersfield on rooftops, and of course, a lot of solar farms uh, in the vicinity of Bakersfield. But uh, lots of thousands of wind turbines 
thousands of megawatts of capacity of wind turbines in Attachby Pass, which is now our way in the mountains, as well as quite a number of uh, massive solar farms, 750 megawatts at a crack. They're out on the desert, not too far away. So you have, you have all those, wind and solar. And in here in Kern County, I might add that we also have a large concentration of geothermal energy, which most people are not aware of, uh, because one, it's, it's hidden on the military base and you just can't go there. People have guns, yeah. they'll keep you out. Uh, but there's a lot of geothermal energy there. So Kern County is kind of like the center of renewable energy here in California. And so, you know, we're going to talk about a, a pretty wide ranging topics, a uh, wide range of topics here on renewables today with, with Paul, because he's got so much experience in all these different areas of it. But uh, today, one of your seemingly big piece of interest is uh, electric cars. And you drive one, you blog about one, you seemingly love it to death. Um, so can you tell us like, what's your current ride right now, right now, Paul? And, uh, you know, why are you so not so, why are you so bought in? Cause I think everyone realizes the, the value of electric cars. Right. But, um, you're, you're a little bit new. You've been driving one for what, uh, is it five years now? Well, it's, it's going on seven years now, but mm. what we're driving now is a Chevy Bolt. That's a B B O L T B as in boy, Chevy Bolt. So that's not a Volt, which we have had in the past. So we've gone through a Leaf, a Volt, a Bolt, and now we're on our second Bolt, and not a Tesla, uh, simply because, well, Teslas still are pretty expensive, and the Bolt, if you, if you shop carefully, you can get a Bolt for half the cost of a Tesla. Tesla is a better car, but the Bolt is a great car. And it'll get you where you need to go, and it gets us where we need to go, and we take it everywhere. We would, we, it's the only car we have. And uh, what I tell people in my advocacy for driving EVs is once you drive an electric car, you're really not going back. You yeah. Just, they can't be beat. What's a, what were the big selling points? Sell me, sell me right now. Well, uh, first of all, um, let's forget about the fact that it's cleaner, um, mm -hmm. that it doesn't have any tailpipe emissions. And then here in California, which has a high percentage of renewable energy in a generation mix, of course, it even has a very low impact from the generation of electricity. Uh, disregarding all that, it's quiet, very quiet. Um, you know, highway speed, you can hear the tire noise, of course. Uh, but it's immediately responsive. If you like the cars, if you're a techie, uh, you're a car guy, uh, when you put your foot on the go pedal or accelerator pedal, since it's not the gas pedal anymore, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it'll, it'll put you back in the seat. And of course, people who drive Teslas point that out all the time, but you can do that in a bolt. I can, I can squeal the tires in a bolt. I pulled up to a stop <laughs> sign with a couple of the, you know, we're in Bakersfield. So we got some of those big trucks with the pipes out the back and revving the engine mm -hmm. and I can beat them to the next light. Uh, and the other, the other advantage of driving, um, electric car is regenerative braking. And so if you have a lot of regenerative braking, like there is in the bolt, they ha it has quite a bit. It even has more than a Tesla. Uh, you can do what we call single pedal driving. And I think that's the way driving a car was always intended. Uh, you don't use the brake pedal unless it's an emergency or you're coming to a stoplight, for example. You should always put your foot on the brake, but you don't really need driving in the mountains, for example, downhill, the regenerative braking decelerates the car and, of course, creates uh, electricity and you store back in the battery. So uh, they accelerate well, they're very uh, sporty feeling, and they decelerate well, and they're just all around a lot more fun to drive. I mean, once you, once you get one, that's it. You're going to keep getting electrics. So, Alan, did you see this coming? I mean, so obviously Alan's our electrical engineer here and, you know, we've talked a lot about, and we're going to get into wind turbines a, a ton. Um, but like the world's really changed as far as battery technology, but has everyone always realized the, I guess the potential of electricity? Cause like for me, I'll give you my example. I have an electric scooter and it's super fun. And same thing, Paul, like you hit the thing and it just goes and you can tell the difference. There's different models of scooters and some bigger, bigger motors and, and whatnot and you can feel like just the instant pickup of the, the more powerful ones but like the world's changing really fast as far as transportation goes with all these different little like you can have the scooters and you can have these little one wheel you can have there's a couple different types of segways that are insane looking that you just like sort of stand over it and the wheels between your legs and you just i see guys flying down the streets in those but 
I mean, everything is changing. I, did everyone realize that this was going to happen? Paul, did you realize this? Alan, did you realize this? Or is this sort of like, oh, we just sort of got here and now this is really going to be a reality? Uh, for, for me, I, my first experience with an electric vehicle is when we built in college. We I went to school in Rolls-Holman in Terre Haute, Indiana. And uh, the back in, this is 1980 eight or 89, the GM had the sun race for a lot of, of colleges uh, participated across the country and the world uh, to design and build a solar powered uh, vehicle. So it had solar cells on it. We had batteries installed inside of it. We, we went to Indianapolis to get the latest and greatest from composite technologies off the uh, Indianapolis 500 race car companies that were located up there. And so we built ourselves an electric vehicle. And at the time, when you start running all the numbers and doing all the calculations back in the late 80s, early 90s, you realize that batteries are a huge problem. First off, uh, getting anything besides lead acid that was relatively inexpensive was near impossible. There were di there's nickel metal hydride, there's some, some space application kind of batteries, but essentially you were limited to lead acid if you wanted to buy something that was realizable. And the same thing on solar cells too. You were, we were trying to get the highest efficiency solar cells we could, and I forget at the time what the, what the percentage was, but it was relatively tiny when you go back and look at it. But we all knew that at the time, and even the electric motors that drove the, the, drove the, the cars, weren't particularly complicated. They're just really kind of the infancy stage of that. But we all knew all the pieces were there. And as Paul has seen, as as technology develops, it's the same basic concept. It's sort of that Tesla foundation where it's it's first concept, right? First concept is you have batteries, you have storage, you have an electric motor, which has all that advantages. And you just got to get the technology up where it becomes available. And that's when, when Paul's talking about buying that Nissan Leaf, I mean, that, that seems like eons ago mm -hmm. today ancient. Ancient. <laughs> ancient right it's just ancient because now you you look at even the bolt and, and all the tesla products and and you and you just uh, are amazed at what the technology has brought and that now we have these giga battery factories out in the middle of the desert now they're building one in germany and mm -hmm. and you realize like the world is changing so fast but at the same time we haven't really come all that far in a sense of, of where we will end up because I, if I don't, I, I used to visit uh, presidential uh, museums and one of the more interesting one was Eisenhower's museum, which is in Kansas. And in, in that museum, you see Eisenhower's electric car, right? It's a battery powered car because it, he came up during the what, 1920s, 10s, mm -hmm. 20s, mm -hmm. right? And there was a lot of roads to speak of and there wasn't available petroleum. so batteries was one of those things that they used to uh, drive the cars with. So uh, it's not relatively new technology, but it's just that we've developed better and better and better pieces to it, which has made it much more um, convenient. I think it's a convenient thing. And as Paul would attest to that bolt you have now is like a, a car, any other car, right? I mean, it, it has all the car. features. Yeah. 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 It's just a car. It's just got electric stuff in it. Yeah. And this yeah. is what I tell people. They say, you know, hey, what about the car? It says EV on it. Said, it's just a car. We just it's treat a car. It like a car now. <laughs> you know, we just drive it. I, I take notes, of course. I keep a spreadsheet and stuff, but that's because I'm a nerd. Um, but but yeah, it's just a car. So I tell people, don't you don't don't get excited about it. it's this car. Um, yeah, plug it in at night. And if you're on a road trip, yeah, there's special plugs for those. But but basically, it's just a car. You drive it like a car. And you know, it's funny that you mentioned Alan that you know, first uh, automobiles were electric. Um, they weren't gas yeah. powered. And it really wasn't right. until Dayton uh, Electric Light Company or Dayton Engineering and Light Company uh, developed a self-starter um, that gasoline-powered engines uh, became um, the predominant technology for for driving automobiles because up until then, you know, people couldn't really use automobiles unless you were a techie and uh, didn't mind right. risking your arm cranking the damn thing. Uh, but right. so that things have changed a lot. And I'll bet that in the late 1980s, when you guys were racing, I may have actually seen your car on this on the highway <laughs> near Anderson, Indiana, passing by the Delco Remy 
uh, yes. plant that built some of those motors that were used in those early uh, experimental hmm. EVs. Yeah, uh, you probably did. <laughs> I got some. I got some really old photographs from that era. Yeah, and then of course yeah. GM, GM dropped the ball, uh, and there was a hiatus, and it's unfortunate um, because <clears throat> during that hiatus, we could be much further than where we are now if we didn't have that hiatus. And the hiatus was in part due to policy um, and a lack of policy from California. California stepped back from the requirements on the auto manufacturers to, to have a certain percentage of their fleet here in California to be electric. Um, and so we lost a lot of years. And it's the same story with renewable energy. I mean, if you want to segue into renewable energy, I'm happy to stay here with the uh, with No, EVs. Paul, you just crushed it, man. That was such a smooth segue. <laughs> Yeah, Man, salty veteran here. <laughs> but but that's a problem we had with uh, renewable energy, wind energy in particular. I mean, we were going gung ho here in California in the 1980s, early 1980s. I obviously have been doing this for a while. And then well, we had the Reagan years. And said, ah, we don't need those windmills and all those solar panels. So, you know, the Danes did it. The Germans did it. Uh, then the Chinese came along and they did it. And but finally, we got back in the game and we're in a game now. And of course, we're growing rapidly in renewable energy, wind and solar, all that stuff. But we lost a good 20 years that we could be so much further ahead than where we are now. But the stuff does work now. We are where we, we are. Uh, we have electric vehicles. It's now a question of getting people to use and buy them, uh, getting the cost down as Tesla is doing. They're forcing the market. Uh, because they're selling a lot of cars, they're selling half a million vehicles a year. That's got GM's attention, certainly got Volkswagen's attention. Of course, Volkswagen got caught with their pants down uh, yeah. in Dieselgate, but uh, yeah, Volkswagen has invested a ton of money uh, in manufacturing. And so has Vestas. And now Vest, I'm not Vestas, I mean Tesla. And Tesla's nest just now joined what? The Dow Jones Industrial Average? Mm -hmm. And Exxon's yeah. out? Yeah. Yeah. It's Whoa. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, in that in that sort of technology shift, we've, we're seeing electric vehicles. I, I agree with you on the on the wind turbine side, uh, particularly the United States. There was a there was a definite lull in the middle of that. But I also think part of that was that there just wasn't a lot of technology advancements in a sense. I, I know on the composite side, and that's where I think a lot of the countries got ahead of the United States was they, they were developing the sort of the more on the composites end. We were the bigger, larger country that had industrial motors and things of that sort. And the market was too small. In a sense, it was too small at the time. Uh, but as the market grew, it seemed like everybody sort of woke up like there, there's once you throw money on the table in any sort of a large industrial scale, Americans will tend to uh, congregate around that and find ways to make money off that off that system. So uh, the, 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 the rate of technology, I agree with you from from the 70s, even up to the early 90s was just like really not there. And then electronics developed, especially power electronics developed mm -hmm. substantially in the early 90s. And then boom, everything just cut, cut loose. It just seems in, in my engineering career has just exploded so that uh, things that were impossible back in the 70s are routine today. And, and if you watch some of that go on and you, you saw both sides, but I think the thing about your experience is you, you saw both saw the sides of it. You saw sort of the technology, but you also saw the policy end of that. Was there just, was there always this sort of disconnect between the two? Even like Tesla today seems to be going through that. There's there's a Tesla technology in and there's the policy in and, and they never seem to to ever meet as some sort of happy medium. Are we, and it seems like the wind term industry has gone through that and we're still in that mode. Is there a sort of coming consensus that's gonna happen around wind pretty soon? Are we getting closer to that? Well, no, there's a, <clears throat> there's a consensus there. There's a consensus with electric vehicles. And I think Alan, you put your finger on it uh, early on in that in that statement that uh, there was no market, but that's why that's how technology develops. It doesn't develop because there's some guy sets in a lab and says, "Oh, I think I'm going to invent something." No, that's because there's a market. Uh, we live in a market economy. I mean, we can be critical of it. I'm a critic of it, but uh, but we live in a market economy. And if you believe in a market economy, you're only going to get this stuff if you create a market for it. Mm -hmm. And that's where where policy comes in. And we abandoned the policy front. And the reason that the Europeans ended up 
being the ones who build wind turbines uh, and solar panels too, we can come back to where the Chinese fit into this picture, um, is because they created a market for it. And then so we didn't, we abandoned the market. We said, ah, the market will take care of itself. No, the market doesn't take care of itself. The market follows policy. And if the policy says we want windmills, uh, we want solar panels, um, then we pay for them. And we had technology that worked in the 80s. Uh, we had technology that worked in solar panels too. I mean, Arco Solar, I mean, <laughs> they were one of the pioneers. Yeah. We had we had one of the first sure. uh, solar power plants uh, just west of Bakersfield. Uh, it was only seven megawatts, but seven megawatts in the 1980s, early 1980s was enormous. Delight. Now there's yeah. 750 megawatts in that same project. So yeah. that's different, but we had the technology and the cost of that technology would have fallen much more rapidly mm -hmm. than it did if the United States had stayed in the game, had continued its policy of saying, we want to develop renewable energy. We made a conscious decision, a political decision. Now, maybe they didn't ask you or I what our opinion was, but we as a nation made a conscious political decision. Eh, we don't care about that stuff. Whereas the Danes said, yeah, we want this. And the Germans said, yeah, we definitely want this. Uh, and eventually the French came along and then the Brits too. Uh, the Brits tried the same approach that we did, failed miserably. And so they're, they buy Danish windmills too, like we do. Uh, even General Electric, which we consider an American company, really the design came from a German company that they bought. Um, right. But so, so they created a market. And that's what the Chinese did too. When the Chinese decided to enter the renewables area, they said, well, this looks like a good thing to do. We need it in our country because we are short of energy. We have this huge industrial expansion. We need a lot of energy. Um, stuff that we're doing is polluting like hell. It's killing our own people, and they might even rise up and overthrow us. And we don't want that. So, uh, and we want to sell a lot of a lot of uh, solar panels and windmills to the Yankees because they buy everything that we send them anyway. And uh, so they said we're going to create a market for that. And they they basically copied what the Germans did. And well, the rest is history. So now stuff's dirt cheap. Uh, anybody builds a coal plant today would be crazy. And in fact, uh, just as a sidebar here, um, General Electric, a few years ago, I think it was only five years ago, bought, can you believe they did this? Five years ago, bought Alstom's, went to the French government, bought Alstom's uh, nuclear turbine fabricating plant. And now they're trying to get rid of, they've lost their shirt and I think there was even talk of GE possibly going bankrupt because of their investments in coal plants and in their, their nuclear um, turbo machinery plant. And now they're trying to get rid of asking the French government to come back and buy it back. Wow. <laughs> so the world can be crazy, but we've made a hell of a lot of progress. Well, so I want to, I do want to transition to, to, Another thing that might be on the horizon, and you're by far the expert on this, but is small wind turbines. So you've been obviously in, in your book, Wind Energy for the Rest of Us, which is, I mean, super thorough on, on like every topic on wind energy. Um, you talk about small wind turbines a lot, and we still don't see them much in the U.S. So my question to you is why and uh, what's holding them back? Like what barrier? We just talked about barriers to the market, but um Paul, what's the deal with small wind turbines? Will we see them at people's homes anytime soon? Oh, that's a tough question. Uh, well, um, small wind does work. Uh, it has a very uh, specific niches or applications where it does work today. Uh, if you're off the grid uh, and you're in place with any wind, uh, you're not tucked away in a cave someplace. Well, your solar is not going to work in a cave either. So anyway, mm. um, if you're, if you're off the grid and you, uh, plan to put in solar, then, uh, you probably need a uh, small wind as well so that you have a hybrid system. So the battery bank doesn't have to be too big and you don't have to have a backup gasoline or diesel generator. So that's one application, but the, the main reason why, uh, small wind uh is not work is not not prevalent today is simply because of cheap solar solar is dirt cheap i mean if you call mike Berge a Berge wind power he says ah it's a cheap chinese solar he always adds chinese to it but it's cheap cheap solar 
and solar has become dirt cheap. Why well, put up a windmill that you know you have to climb and fix occasionally uh, when you can put the solar panel on your roof and you can just hose off the bird shit periodically. <laughs> so um, you know, solar solar is cheap. Solar is simple. Um, the other the other problem is that um, uh, there are um, legal and regulatory uh, hurdles to installing small wind. Um, Obviously, your neighbors don't want to have a tall wind turbine in some, your neighbor's yard uh, because if it falls over, it might land on their yard. So there's all kinds of regulatory stuff that solar panels don't have to face. Well, I know there are some people complain about they're all blue and I hate blue, you know, that the right. kind of yeah, sure. stupid yeah. stuff or, or they're green solar panels. And I prefer blue, you know, whatever. But, you know, <laughs> but generally, we, we have a permitting process that allows solar to go in, even in America. Uh, even in California, we actually say it's a good idea that you can put solar on your roof in California. Mm -hmm. But the wind turbine saying, well, I don't know. We better think about that a little bit. And there's a lot more discussion. And people will say, well, I, you know, windmills kill birds. And, um, you know, I, I hear that the reflection is going to cause cause me to have Alzheimer's or we, we pick something. Um, and uh, or trigger ADHD or some some kind of. Well, well let's talk about that because on our, okay. our, our pre call last week, we talked a bunch about misconceptions. So there have been a lot of oh, misconceptions yeah. that have really hurt the wind industry, and you've seen them throughout the last bunch of decades. So what are what are some of these big ones, and did they actually have an impact? Uh, well, they uh, the myths can have an impact in that they can influence uh, policy decisions. So policies at the state, regional, and federal level. Uh, for example, there is a there's a country uh, in the world today that has a president who thinks windmills cause cancer. So that country probably is not going to do anything right now to encourage wind energy. Mm -hmm. um, though the wind energy is growing fine without him because he doesn't really know uh, one way or the other what's going <laughs> <Yeah>. on. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, so it can have have an effect on policy. Uh, but in the regulatory and legal arena, uh, very rarely do these kind of uh, myths uh, affect the outcome. Uh, what they do do is, of course, force the person who wants to put up the wind turbine to go through a long, expensive and legal process to say, well, it doesn't really cause cancer. There's no evidence of that. If you have evidence, can, can you prove it? And mm -hmm. then the other, other parties say, well, you know, this is the evidence we have. And they say, well, but that's anecdotal or hearsay. Do you have any doctors ever looked at this stuff? And they say, well, no, not really. And they, so then the judge says, ah, eh, and, and throws it out. So uh, the consequences are more one in terms of general public image of wind energy in this case uh and that public policy so politicians who not always the brightest people on earth um a lot of them are attorneys not engineers we have very few engineers who are in uh, congress uh, in the united states and i think that's a real problem uh, we need a lot more engineers uh in congress uh and in uh, parliament in canada uh, than we have now but at any rate some of them aren't the brightest bulbs in a box and they'll believe this stuff because, well, it might be useful to their political career. And then they might propose policies that say, well, you can't have windmills that are blue. Well, you can't have solar panels that are blue because blues make people upset. I, I'm just giving you an example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we yeah. have a lot of stuff that's really wacko. And you say, Woof, where did they get that? And you have to go back and you step back. And you have to go back and back and find out, well, how did this originate? Where did this come from? For example, I told you guys uh, last week, about the case of, you know, you when you didn't know probably that windmills attract sharks. Right. Well, <laughs> they well, leap, they try to leap through it. It's, you, like, you, it's, like, it's you, like a game for you that. Heard it, you heard it, you heard it here <laughs> first. Yes, windmills attract sharks. And uh, uh, French speaking sharks only for the moment. Um, uh, on the um, Ile de Guadeloupe uh, in the Caribbean, uh, there was a small wind farm proposed uh, using small wind turbines. So not not the kind that we have now, but small, relatively small. And um, <laughs> so there was a, bit, a huge outcry against putting up these wind turbines. It's going to, you know, a couple dozen of these things, and they're pretty small to begin with. And there's this huge outcry that uh, they were going to attract sharks. And it's, you know, the Guadalupe. I mean, people go to the beach a lot, uh, and, you know, they don't like sharks. Sharks eat people, and they don't want to be eaten. So this is bad. You know what? Windmills come because they're going to cause attract sharks, and sharks are going to eat people. So this is pretty serious stuff. So, so, so a researcher looked into this and tried to figure out what's going on here, found out that there was a conference held at a hotel 
uh, about the economic investment opportunities of developing wind energy on Guadalupe. And he pitched this as we're going to attract the sharks of Wall Street to invest in Guadalupe. <laughs> wow. And so the word got out, they're attracting sharks, but they were American sharks from Wall Street That's and not the unbelievable. Kind of in the ocean. But wow. people didn't hear that. They thought of the swimming sharks that eat people. Okay, that's, but roughly, but, you can't make that up. That's a, that's amazing. I, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, 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 I like that one. I mean, that's why I tell you that story. Of course, I tell you about the ones that windmills uh, cause uh, uh, rattlesnakes to come out of the ground and kill people. Um, but that's not as much fun as the shark one. I like the shark one better. Or, yeah, the, shark or one's great. The, the windmills cause, cause your guts to turn to mush and they come out places where things come out. Yeah, I don't need to tell you that one either. Mm, man. <laughs> Well, Paul, did you hear about the uh, the icebreaker wind farm in uh, it was going to be in Lake Erie? There was a yes. lot of a lot of hullabaloo yes. about it this year because mm -hmm. it looked like it was going to happen, and then it looks like a local, whether it was coal um, or whatever, you know, local industry that was sort of opposed to losing perhaps some business to this, sort of started to lobby, and they said, yeah, this caused a negative environmental impact on the animals, or you know, whether it's fish or or fowl. I think it was mostly fowl. They're claiming. And so, so are there, they basically are there said, any, any, any sharks in uh, Lake Erie? Uh, well, <laughs> it's going to actually, <laughs> I've heard it's going to mutate the fish, the lake trout into becoming, yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but they essentially got an order and they got reversed, but they said that, you know, hey, you have to, you're, you can go ahead with this, but you're going to have to turn the wind turbines off for like eight hours a day. They're like, well, then this is not feasible. Like this can't possibly make financial sense. Um, but then they someone came to their wits and they reversed this and it looks like it's going to go forward. It's still kind of rocky, it seems like. But I mean, is that a pretty common scenario? I mean, you've you've been doing this for a long time. How many stories are there like that, Paul? Oh, there's a lot of stories. Um, we <laughs> we'd spend a lot of time on this. <laughs> um, but in the, in the yes, well, <laughs> I, I like to say, I like to say, I've said in my books that if we develop wind energy in a certain way or in ways that are a little bit different than what we're doing now and give people an op, I still have faith in humanity and it's being tested. It's been tested the last few years. It's still tested, but I still have faith in humanity. If you give them an opportunity to learn to live with wind energy or renewable generally they say well yeah okay i don't like blue solar panels and i don't like green windmills but but they're okay um i think that uh, over time people will become more accepting of wind turbines and solar panels and what else um but in the case here it's wind energy because they're big physical things and they they turn around i mean we can see them on the landscape um and we can hear them solar panels we don't hear because they don't do anything they just sit there mm -hmm. um and they don't stand up in the sky and they don't move around. Uh, so windmills are far more visible. So we notice them more than we do other technologies. Uh, and so as a consequence, we who are advocates of uh, wind energy need to be particularly attuned to the fact that some people may be put off by that, put off by the fact that they're turning, that they're visible, that they're nearby. They don't know what they are. The president says they cause cancer. The, the French in Guadeloupe said they attract sharks. So, so we, we have to spend a lot of time addressing these questions. Uh, but I, it's my hope that over a period of time that the bulk of the public uh, accepts this. And every opinion survey that I've ever seen shows that um, the majority, I mean, the two thirds to three quarters of people polled in almost any country uh, want more wind energy. Uh, maybe they want a little bit more solar because solar is not quite as uh, disruptive as a wind turbine because you can see the windmill as a court, as I've said. Um, but they want more of it. They're more supportive of it. If you ask them about a nuclear plant, they'll say, well, nope, don't want that. Okay. So uh, most people support uh, wind energy uh, if you do a public opinion per per survey, but it only takes 10%. Only takes five percent. They only take one percent of the people to stop your project. Yeah. Uh, particularly if those are key people. Uh, right. By the people on the public utility commission, or was this uh, offshore siting council, or whatever was made the decision on the icebreaker project, it only took a few people. Mm -hmm. So it's probably not even one percent. 
But if you uh, try to get the majority of people, and we still live in a democracy, I say, well, most people accept this, and it's not really going to hurt you. Uh, it's for the best for everybody. It's best for the environment. It's best for all of us. We have a cleaner world, uh, and it's a good thing to do, and we should do it. And if that's putting wind turbines off of uh, Cleveland uh, in Lake Erie, then why is it taking us so damn long? Yeah. Well, how, by, the how, and, get, by the time they get this thing built, it's going to be two decades. Yeah. Well, and Paul, where has this industry, in, in, in particular the wind turbine industry, over the years really dropped the ball in terms of marketing this to the larger community? Because it's it seems like there's had several open opportunities that they have the door is open. All I need to do is walk through it and it, very minimal amount of effort, in my opinion, it would have taken to really change the level of discourse. Where, where have you seen those key points points been over time on the, on the marketing side? Well, certainly, certainly here in the United States, and I would say probably in Canada as well as I think the industry has been too damn greedy. Um, I think that if we had enabled uh, public policies that, made it possible for other people besides Florida Power and Light and Electricity de France uh, and all the people who actually are developing wind energy in the United States and Canada, uh, give other people the opportunity to build and own their own wind turbines, uh, not, not a little windmill in your backyard necessarily, but maybe it could be a community owned wind turbine or it could, could be a community owned wind farm, a group of wind turbines uh, that's, uh, that's theirs. It's not the other guys. Uh, that there might be a greater uh, acceptance of, for example, um, if this Cleveland project could have been done by a municipal utility, that's a little bit better than just a private utility. I think this is going to be a private company, whatever it is, going to do this, but it could have been done by the people of Cleveland. I mean, it could have been the people's co-op. Cleveland, mm -hmm. I think, uh, wasn't Dennis, somebody, Kucinich is, was from Cleveland. They can say, mm -hmm. it's the people's co-op. It's going to be the people's wind farm. Uh, it might make it a little bit more acceptable, but that's not the plan. And that's not the way we've done things in the United States. But that's not, there are other places in the world that have developed wind energy and they've developed in a different way. Denmark, for example, Germany, for example. Um, and there's some interest in has been in the UK, but definitely Germany and Denmark developed wind energy was owned by uh, people in the community, and that was quite a bit different. Now it's changed. Uh, we can talk about that, but but it's changed. But uh, that's why I, I say in my book the title is wind energy for the rest of us. So wind energy needs to grow, needs to grow rapidly uh, to 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 meet our climate targets, uh, to to protect us. But mm. we need to broaden the market to not just the giants of the electric utility world, not just to Electricity de France uh, or Energie de Portugal uh, or uh, Preussen Electra. Well, they changed their names, so they're not Preussen Electra anymore. There's mm -hmm. some Aeon, but, but you right. know, it could be owned by, you know, people in Bakersfield even. Right. Oh, sure. Well, that, 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 that sort of uh, local wind turbine marketplace was there for a certain amount of time. And I always felt like uh, there, was, there was an impetus back in the 70s and 80s into or maybe not so much in the 90s, but 70s, 80s definitely was where the, the industry hurt itself in terms of the quality of the product. The mm. longevity wasn't there. And, and you highlight that in your book a little bit. Like this, these are all the generations of wind turbines and these are the things that did not work. And these are the things that have you know gone on to the longer lifetimes. That sort of, I don't want to say necessarily it's quality because some part of it was just straight up engineering at, at the time. Mm -hmm. it, it, that I think that really delayed some part of the inevitability of this, that if we had done a better job, it's sort of like the Tesla situation. I don't like using analogies, but I'll use the analogy of Tesla here, which is when Tesla had some early crashes, especially with the automated driving thing, that really hurt them. That slowed down their progress a really good bit. And they had a, they, I mean, there was a period in which Tesla was gonna go broke. And that, that sort of thing happened to, I think a bunch of wind turbine companies in that mm -hmm. same mode where the quality wasn't there. Do you see that quality and the consistency and the, the lifetime of the product finally getting to where that advertised space, that sort of 20 year lifespan? Are we, are we getting closer to that right now? No, 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 we're there. No, yeah, but it's, 
No, they, they, these are commercial products now. They have all the benefits and problems of any commercial technology now. It's the standard stuff. Uh, GE will be happy. General Electric would be happy to sell you a thousand windmills uh, at you know yeah. a five million piece uh, if you get the discount discount bunch. Uh, you buy them by the dozen kind of thing. Right, uh, right. No, no, they're they're there's a they're commercial products. Solar panels the same way. Uh, it's it's like every other industry though. I mean, you do have to be careful. I mean, it's a lot of money and uh, it's, it, it's technology. Yeah. It produces electricity and, you know, electricity is serious stuff. You gotta be, you know, kills people. So you gotta, gotta be right. careful. And, and there's some, there's some Chinese, um, well, let's just say there's some solar products that uh, I wouldn't recommend. There are wind turbines I don't recommend, but most of the big commercial players, that's pretty standard stuff. Um, where you get into this fringe now is inventions uh new guy's got a it's going to save the world with some new windmill invention mm -hmm. and most of the time it's crackpot stuff occasionally you see some serious efforts where people put serious money into a crackpot idea <laughs> and it's still <laughs> it's still a crackpot idea but it's had a lot of money behind it so the engineering <laughs> is good so so alan you you would be happy i mean they they had good engineers but it was still a crackpot idea and the whole company you know implodes an example of that would be um, flow design, uh, Ogen, who they burned through, I think 300 and some million dollars, uh, in money. And they hired a lot of engineers, MIT, MIT engineers, not Rose Holman. I didn't hear anybody about Rose Holman being there. Uh, but a lot of MIT engineers, um, <clears throat> Maybe got a Harvard guy in there too, just just to round it out. But, count the money, yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, he, <laughs> probably the guys who ran the company were Harvard because they, you know, I think they did okay in the project. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, so it was an, a, an idea that had been discarded many, many times in the past. But of course, they, you know, brought it back, and of course, they were going to do it better than anybody else. And uh, it's the ducted wind turbine. Well, I think you guys right. talked. Abducted with yeah, we, no, we, yeah, we, we need you to set us straight. Remember, yeah, yeah. that's exactly well, right. <laughs> so <laughs> this was a let's have it, Paul. And it was a windmill with a big shroud around it, and of course, yeah. it has a shroud, and everybody understands that. You know, it's like a funnel. Mm -hmm. Works the opposite of a funnel, but but it's it's there, and so people say, well, yeah, that that looks like that's a lot better than those big things, spindly things out there with them long, slender blades. And uh, so it's natural that you know investors line up to throw their money at this stuff including the U.S. government, who should know better. Uh, of course, they should ask people who know better, but they don't. Uh, and and they, th they throw money at this thing because, well, I mean, it looks like it's got a funnel on it. And, uh, well, it didn't. And uh, <clears throat> if you, you have to read between the lines. But anyway, $300 million. So most of these crackpot things, you know, they, they fleece a few investors and that's it. But these are the big boys. And when they yeah. do the fleecing, they do it. A good job. They're pros. They're pros at this. Uh, let's see, Gary Dewar, I think he was uh, the guy behind this, the the, the Wall Street um, uh, venture capital firm that did Google. So uh, they've had some winners. And this one mm -hmm. was not, sure. this is not a winner. And and they blew through uh, $60 million of the Alberta Pension Fund and the $50 million of the New Zealand uh, Pension Fund. Uh, got nothing for it. Uh, they had one prototype in Kern County. They had, I think, seven pre-production models in Palm Springs before they concluded, hey, oh, they're just not going to get the performance that they promised everybody. And so it's gone, kaput. Surprise, surprise. Wow. Right. So yeah. can you can yeah. you talk more to that, Paul? So you devote a good amount of time in your book. And um, this was one of the, in you researching us to see if you want to come on our show, you said, oh, well, I got to set you straight on ducted. So <laughs> tell us about, because it does seem like a good idea. This is why people, people well, first I got, I got to pause you. Did you yeah. ever, are you a Simpsons fan, Paul? Oh, I'm sorry. I know who they are. Okay. There is a Simpsons episode where this salesman comes in. He wants to sell a monorail to the town of Springfield. Alan, do you remember this episode? And he like, oh, gets, yeah. he wins their hearts and this big emotion and everyone's singing, like he has them all singing monorail, monorail. And he just basically fleeces them, takes their money and skips town. Um, it's an amazing classic episode, but... Um, is, it's the music man. It's all it is. It's the music man in, in Simpson cartoon fashion. Yeah. Right? Well, it, sounds fashion. Like the, it sounds like the Pied Piper. Yes, very so, yes, exactly. Yes. But so <laughs> ducted fans seem to make sense, but why do they not work in practicality? 
Well, I, again, I'll go back to, um, you know, we have an intuitive sense. Unfortunately, our intuitive sense is, is, is based on intuition. It's not necessarily based on engineering analysis. So intuitive sense says, this is funnel, and you're going to put more wind into it, and that'll make the wind turbine go faster or stronger, or whatever you want to say. But the wind is not like a hydro plant. I mean, we know how hydro power plants work. I and mean, we have a big penstock, which is a great big tube, and the water's inside it. And it goes through the turbine and turns the turbine. And we say, well, let's just do the same thing with the windmill. But the wind is different. The wind just goes around the windmill. So the whole design of the duct is very sophisticated to get the wind to exit just the way it can properly with the, with the best aerodynamic engineers in the world so that it draws more wind through the rotor. So to typically what they do is they make the argument the rotor is more efficient than the same rotor size of a conventional windmill. Mm -hmm. And you could say, guys like me say, well, yeah, that's probably true. Prove yeah. it, but yeah. probably true. But that's not the point. The point is cost-effective electricity. And that includes the whole thing. It includes the duct and the windmill part, the spinning part, and all the other stuff that you have to have with it. So to produce cost-effective electricity, and remember, we're still trying to compete with coal and oil, nuclear and natural gas, all that stuff, uh, and people still have to pay for it. So, you know, cost does become, is, is, is not the sole criteria, but it is an important criteria. So, so that includes the duct. And what we've found is that the duct is a very expensive thing, even if it's composite materials. And usually you can get the same result by just making the, the rotor blade a little bit longer because it's the square of the diameter. Mm -hmm. And that's a subtle thing. It's not always intuitive that you get that. And the other aspect to a ducted wind turbine is uh, windmills are not like solar panels. We don't have solar hurricanes where the sun just gets super bright and it's going to burn everything up. But we do have hurricanes with windmills. We have high winds with windmills and we, we have to know how to deal with them. Otherwise, we don't have a windmill anymore. I mean, yeah. it was a good windmill, but it's not there now. So uh, we, we have to have ways to keep the windmill in one piece. And when you have a ducted wind turbine, you have the duct. It's out there. And what are you going to do with it? Where, where do you put it? What, so far, nobody's got an idea of what, what to do with the duct when there's hurricane force winds and you you uh, you have to somehow mitigate the forces on the wind turbine. So what they have to do with a ducted wind turbine, they have to make it wind strong enough to withstand all those forces, which means everything's got to be stronger, means more expensive. Yeah, expensive. So yeah. the bottom line is nobody's built a ducted wind turbine that has been cost effective. Uh, and then we could go argue, say, well, has a ducted wind turbine ever exceeded the BETS limit, which is our measure of efficiency in the wind industry? And you say, well, not if you consider the duct, but if you consider just the rotor, yes. So in the advertising, they say, well, our rotor is going to, you know, do better than the BETS. And then guys like me say, yeah, 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 okay. But but we're out the big thing around the outside and say, well, that, you know, that, that, we don't, we don't want to talk about that. So... <laughs> Uh, so, so the windmill, the two problems with the duct is you got the big duct and then you have to have something to hold it in the high winds. So it's big and beefy. And so like in the Ogen, um, flow design, which is the $300 million investment by the, by the venture capital firm with Dewar, uh, was that, well, if you stick it way up in the air, uh, then it's really hard to hold on to the thing, right? Because it's cantilevered <laughs> load. It's got to be in the ground and, you know, the yeah. wind's right on. So, so they kept it short. Well, and then if it's short, the winds aren't very strong. So, you know, you nope. just, you're, just, you're yeah. just fighting an uphill battle. So like I, like I try to say, tell people who, you know, also bring to me vertical axis wind turbine designs and so on. I said, yeah, yeah. okay, I don't care if you're an inventor and you want to play with this thing in your backyard. Don't put your retirement savings in it because, you know, right. you, you're going to, your wife's going to leave you, you know, blah, blah, blah. Don't, <laughs> don't endanger yourself, your friends. Uh, and don't ask any money from the government uh, because I pay taxes. Um, unlike other people, I pay taxes. And, and don't, don't ask whatever you do. Don't say this is going to save the world and hold up the renewable energy revolution we need right now. In other words, go ahead and play with the thing and get out of the way. 
that, that's the hardest part is like getting rid of all the, all, I don't want to say crazy, but I mean, some part of it's a little insane uh, of, of ideas that we've been through before that haven't proven out and they're not going to prove out because the laws of physics are not going to allow it, which then brings me to the next point is, mm -hmm. okay, how big are we going to go on with some of these wind turbines and what's, what's the play on offshore? Because right now you're hearing numbers, 20 megawatt, 30 megawatt machines. Is that even a reality? Okay. First of all, you shouldn't ask me that question because I have been consistently wrong throughout my career <laughs> on this, how big the wind turbines are going to get. Okay. Uh, because I've said, I can't get any bigger than this. And of course, then they got bigger. And then I say it again and they get, and they get bigger. So I'm the wrong guy to ask because I've been wrong so many times. But yeah, an offshore is different than onshore. An offshore is different because, well, it's so expensive to put anything in the ocean. You got to really maximize every bit of revenue stream you can from the wind. So you have to have this ginormous rotor. And because the winds offshore are typically much higher than on land, you can put a really big generator on the back of it. But just keep in mind, this is, this is the illustration I used uh, to, to emphasize why generator size is inappropriate for wind energy or to describe wind turbines is you can have a two by four and put a 20 megawatt generator on it and call it a 20 megawatt generator. But it won't That's do true. anything. And yeah, it won't do anything. 20 right. megawatts. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Well, maybe, so maybe, a two, maybe a two by four is wrong. I mean, a two by six. <laughs> oh, gotcha. There, now it's better. A couple surfboards, a couple surfboards. Yeah. Just, yeah. Right. Elmer's glue. <laughs> Okay, so well, that, 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 let, that, go, that just me, drives go a little bit. Let me go a little bit further on yeah. offshore because what we, we see even on onshore intercon, um, Alois Boben's company in Germany, uh, their turbines are getting so big that transport was a problem. You know, hauling these big braids, blades around densely populated country like France or Germany or Denmark. So they, they've yeah. actually sh ship them now in two pieces and then they actually assemble them on the site and then they, they lift yeah. it up in the air. Uh, and we talked about doing that 30 years ago, but the only ones we did were a couple of government projects and those turbines were all blown up and, you know, sold for scrap. Uh, so this is that, and I think that's- Well, that's that's just it, right? I mean, as you good to, if you're gonna do that offshore size, you, you're gonna have to build factories right on the shoreline. There's no other way to deal with it. And you're gonna have to probably assemble this, some of this on site. And that's it. That's possibly that we will actually assemble some of these on the ship. I'm not. I'm not sure, but but certainly uh, for offshore, the offshore industry, they're building the harbors. The big. They, yeah. They, they're they're putting the factories at the harbor. Vestas, uh, when Vestas Vestas is the world's largest manufacturer of wind turbines, is Danish. Uh, it's from a small town in Denmark called Lamb. And nearby Lem is Rinkabing, and Rinkabing is a harbor, it's a port, and there was a shipbuilding factory at the port. Well, you know, they don't build ships anymore, so that's just bought it. That's where they build big windmills. Yeah, I mean, those just seem like they're going to have to, like you said, like building in the factory at the harbor is going to just be a necessity for these to get any bigger. But then it <laughs> also still seem like split blades and, and just like other ways to, like you said, reduce and prefab stuff is probably the only way that they're going to continue to get bigger because we've all seen those videos of the blades meandering through a town <laughs> or whatever. It's just, it's crazy. And it's just like, can't get much bigger. They're going to have to be in pieces. Right. I, I think, the, you, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not a big YouTube watcher, but I know there's some YouTube videos of some of these they're guys fascinating. driving these long trucks fascinating. through some mm -hmm. of these small towns. And I saw one the other day, Somehow, I don't know, it came across my feed. The guy got his directions wrong. We talked about that a month oh, ago. Oh, you talked about yeah. it. Okay, that yeah. was telling me. Okay, yeah, and oh he had to back gosh, up yeah. for kilometers or something. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. I, I knew high. it was recent that I heard about it. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a funny story, but it's true. I mean, those truck drivers, I had a friend, uh, he said he had his commercial driver's license for a little while. And it just wasn't for him, but he said, he said, man, like I was driving, I can't remember what he was hauling, but he's like going down some of those inclines with tons and tons and tons on this truck. He's like, I was just so afraid of this truck and of like making any little mistake. And, uh, like you talk about say everyone's like concerned about safety 
of the technicians going up these wind turbines, right? It's a terrifying job, and it seems like they have a really good track record of safety. But at the same time, there's all these other things that you probably don't think about that are a really big safety hazard, and perhaps way more so, which might just be the trucking of the darn things, right? Absolutely. Very valid point and very perceptive point. Um, we want to use renewable energy, in my case, wind energy. We want to use wind energy because it's preferable to uh, other sources, conventional sources, because of the effects it has on people. So we don't want renewable energy to kill people or injure them uh, because that's not the point. The point mm -hmm. is to, to, to make it better for all of us. And so we, we in the industry, of course, have to do everything we can to make the workplace as safe as possible. Uh, and now the industry is big enough that OSHA and other regulatory agencies around the world look over our shoulders all the time. Uh, every major company has its own safety program that uh, complies with OSHA here in the United States and uh, the DIN requirements in Germany and so on. And that's good. That's the way we should be. It wasn't like that all the time. And as, as Dan mentioned, uh, you know, just transport of these things can be can be dangerous, uh, you know, a 30, 40, 50 meter blade going down a highway with a trailer behind it. Uh, you know, there's a long space in between and, you know, it's like a train, right? People can drive underneath it and get killed. And we have had people uh, in the United States uh, killed in collisions with wind turbine blade carriers or I, maybe it was the, the truck that yeah, carrying sure, parts yeah, of the winter, but I don't remember the blade or the nacelle, but, sure. but they, they, they crashed into it and they died. Uh, and I, I don't know if I put that one in my statistic as a wind energy accident. I may have because it was a blade or something mm -hmm. like that. But I, I kind of keep track of that stuff. Um, and we, we've had, <clears throat> we've had people commit suicides. Uh, wind turbines are like uh, bridges. Uh, and you know, people still jump off bridges and we don't have always have fences on bridges. And, and, and in the early days, we didn't lock the doors and people climbed up the wind turbines and jumped off. So all the wind turbines should have a door that's locked or a nine non climbable tower sections so that uh, people can't, who are depressed, uh, kill themselves. Uh, we don't want people killing themselves on a wind turbine. Uh, and we, we've had some really, you know, just horrific accidents. Uh, we have had a parachutist killed by a wind turbine. Uh, you guys may not have known that one, but that's yeah. uh, pretty pretty odd. Uh, her first unassisted jump. Uh, oh. Her her trainer landed safely, but she didn't. She flew into a wind turbine and she died. So mm. you know we, we we do have these cases, and you know they're they're not pretty. That's not nice stuff to talk about. It's not all the techie stuff and it's not all that we're going to save the world uh, this is real real people real families have been affected um i've written about this i've written about these accidents and i've had family members contact me and uh we, sure. we want to do everything we can we don't want to be like the coal industry um we don't want to be like the gas and oil and gas industry um we want to make sure our people go home to their families that's yeah. a really good point because I think that the wind industry has been really up front of that for quite a while. Well, other industries have not been. I think the wind industry has really, at least, especially lately, anytime mm -hmm. I've got anywhere near a turbine, it's the steel-toed shoes, it's the safety glasses, it's the helmet, it's the uh, uh, training, the lanyards, the yeah, and the lanyards. <clears throat> yeah, it's 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 amazing, and there's no there's no messing around. There is no messing around when you're working on turbines, and I, I think that's probably to their benefit, right? I mean, you treat them like the, mach the machine deserves to be treated uh, with a lot of respect because uh, it will get you if you're not careful. Yeah. Well, that's right. I mean, you're an engineer and we, we all work with electricity and uh, uh, we know the electricity kills. And so, but we yeah. use electricity. Uh, we use it every day. Uh, <clears throat> we've done over 100, 150 years, learned, learned all the things not to do. Well, we've learned right. a lot of things. In the wind industry, not to do. Uh, we still make mistakes and accidents still happen, but we we try to avoid that. And in the early days, our record was not very good. I mean, actually, our record True. was terrible. Yeah, but but yeah. but the industry got its act together, and that's to their credit. Uh, and I'm glad of that. Yeah. Yeah, it's something. To, it's something really for the wind industry to be proud of today. And uh, you see a lot yeah. of the different winter companies really highlight that, and and rightfully they should. And it's good. Mm -hmm. It's good mm -hmm. stuff. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, on that note, Paul, uh, obviously you said you don't like to forecast too much. Like you don't, you can't predict the future. So sorry for those of you listening, Paul can't predict the future, but, uh, one of the interesting changes in the industry is obviously all the use of drones, which this seems like a perfect mm -hmm. solution for, for drones, obviously. Um, with, I mean, you've seen lots of changes over the many decades you've been in, um, you know, a wind energy insider, how big of a change do you feel like the drone technology is? to wind term. I mean, do you, do you feel like these are going to be fully automated in the future? Like, will anyone go onto a blade on a rope in the future? Well, I, actually, Dan, that's, that's an excellent question. I'm very good. You guys got some good questions. Yeah. I, drones are make really making a big inroad in uh, wind turbine service uh, and maybe, and certainly in photography, mm -hmm. I know a German photographer who uses drones now, and they are some fantastic photographs. Uh, but in terms of wind turbine service blade inspection, oh, that is just makes life so much better for everybody, both the, the people who have to know what the blade is looking like, what's doing, and also the people who have to service. But at some point, of course, we, if the blade does need to be repaired, it either has to be taken off the wind turbine, which is a big job, really big yeah. job, or it has to be fixed in situ or in place, and then that requires people to go out there. So we're gonna still still need the people with ropes. Um, and <clears throat> interestingly, a colleague of mine uh, over in Santa Cruz, he started a company uh, doing the rappelling down the blades to fix the blades and inspect, inspect the blades and then repair them. And now he's got a drone business. So oh, you're wow. obviously right on target. Uh, there are a number of companies do drones. His company does drones. And I know in Europe, there are lots of companies doing drones now. Well, as, 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 as we wrap up here, Paul, you've been in this industry for a long time. You said you've been threatened. You, like, you've, you've fought a lot of your battles. Uh, and there's a lot of people, especially in my generation, I mean, I'm, I'm in my mid thirties, uh, but people care a lot about the environment today, maybe more so than they ever have. I don't know. If, no, that's just anecdote, but um, for people who are looking to get into renewable energy, who are passionate about it, who maybe want to make a career out of it or just want to advocate for it, what advice would you give them as someone who's devoted a large part of his life to it? Uh, well, there's a lot of opportunity uh, in renewable energy. It's growing exponentially around the world, which as, as it should. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for women because women are not well represented in the renewable energy industry uh, or in the electric vehicle industry for that matter. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for women. Women have to make a space for themselves, but uh, most of the companies now are open to the idea. Uh, and we need a lot more engineers. Uh, don't go be an attorney. Don't go to Harvard and study study to be an attorney. Uh, you know, our vice, best and brightest in the United States uh, go to become attorneys. And we we got a plenty of those. They're, they're OK. We need them when we need them. But we need engineers. Uh, we need engineers in the United States. We need technical people. Not everybody needs to go to college. Right. Um, we can, we need talented people who work in the, in as technicians, service technicians. Uh, this is yeah. very sophisticated stuff to troubleshoot, uh, power electronics, uh, troubleshoot the control systems, computer control systems on these things. We need good people who do that. And fortunately now there are some community colleges are offering technical training for, uh, tr for troubleshooting technicians for both solar and, uh, wind energy. Uh, there should be plenty of opportunity there. Um, most of these jobs are non-union, don't have to be non, they don't have to be non-union, but they're currently non-union, but, uh, we need more people doing that stuff. And so I think this is a growing business. Uh, don't go in oil, don't go in gas. Those are dead end jobs. Uh, don't go, uh, build, uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. Those are dead end jobs. If you want a career for the future, you're young, go to engineering school or, or go to a trade school and yeah. uh, get into get into renewables or in electric vehicles and do it now because uh, this is ground still the ground floor. Awesome. Well, Paul, we uh, we really appreciate your time. It's been a great conversation. You're very you're probably one of our favorite guests. You're super fun. You're very direct. <laughs> yeah. you got lots of anecdotes. Uh, <laughs> we need to get you off camera so we can hear some of your your more. Um, what's what, what colorful, colorful. <laughs> <laughs> great way of putting it Alan. um but correct me if i'm wrong here so is it eight books in your lineup i'm looking right through them here but your most uh, recent was you know unfortunately i'm i'm losing track now but that's well, a yeah, good thing I, I remember it it's so it looks like eight so definitely if you're out there be sure to pick up some of paul's books if you're interested in wind energy 
whether you're deep into it or you're you're new to it and you want to learn more about it they're really fascinating machines just the history of it's really fascinating and paul's mm -hmm. latest book wind energy for the rest of us is super thorough super long i mean <laughs> even if you just use it as a as a reference that's what i think it's, it's probably reference. best like you want to oh yeah you want to learn about how much they cost this part of them what are they made of where they originate the history like duck did why this thing fail that thing fail i mean there's so many it's a great just like tome to have to just like flip through so al and i each right. have a copy and if, you, and if, you, if you need a door stay open <laughs> they make great door stops as well and Why intruder I'm and intruder in the night it's beefy yeah. enough you can knock oh. you know a line a lineman down so yeah but check him out also wind-works.org is paul's website and you're writing mostly about uh electric vehicles more so today than you are about wind right that's correct. Yeah, I, I wrote an article just the other day on this vertical axis wind turbine, but mostly about electric vehicles these days. Our, our personal experience with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but definitely keep up, keep up with Paul. And, and Paul, is there anywhere else on the web that people can follow up with you? Is you have a newsletter list? Like, where can people stay in touch with what you're doing? Well, uh, my email, of course, is on the web. I'm easily accessible by email. And uh, if you want to be added to my little newsletter distribution, uh, there's a sign up sheet on my website so you can go there and it's it's got the standard unsubscribe stuff. So if you don't like what I say, you can just unsubscribe. Gotcha. Well, we'll put links to everything uh, Paul has in the show notes or the description here in YouTube. So if you want to check him out, just uh, flip open iTunes or go to the description in YouTube. You'll find his email list, uh, his books, all that stuff. So it'll be easy to access and you can follow up with Paul. Paul, thanks again. We really appreciate it. It was a great conversation today. Oh, well, thank you. It was great. I love talking to you guys and uh, good luck there, okay? 